So now that we're experts at understanding protein structure, the last real topic of the chapter that we need to think about is, although there's lots of data that talks about what structures of proteins look like, the question is, how do they get there? How do they get converted from a primary sequence that doesn't have any kind of prime or, uh, overall three-dimensional structure to a folded protein that does whatever precise enzymatic job that it's supposed to do. Now the short answer to this particular issue is that we don't really know all that will well still about exactly how this works. We're getting better and we have some ideas but this is really an active area of uh, biochemical uh, research today. Now before we get into the guts of thinking about protein folding dynamics I just want to give you a very very quick overview about a couple of methods people use to study protein folding which really is a thermodynamic type of experiment. What is the free energy for going from a folded form of a protein to an unfolded form? Because it's going to affect uh, some of what we think about here coming, uh, coming ahead. Uh, the first experiment that typically gets done when you study protein folding is an experiment called protein uh, melting studies. Now it's not melting like what you and me think of as melting solid to liquid per se, but it does involve heat and ultimately this experiment is referred to as a heat denaturation experiment. So what you do in a melting experiment is you take a protein that is in a folded conformation at say 37 degrees Celsius and then you slowly warm it up and observe how long it takes before it becomes or gets converted completely to the unfolded form. And with some sophisticated mathematics and some knowledge of biophysical chemistry from heat denaturation experiments you can actually back out free energy values for the folding process. Now the theory of that is definitely beyond the scope of our course but I'll just tell you that there's whole areas of research that deal with this particular uh, topic. The second related method for studying protein stability is similar to protein melting except instead of using heat to denature uh, your biomolecules you use chemical methods and so the two chemicals that tend to be get tend to get used for these studies commonly are called urea and guanidinium chloride. But as you can see, the concentrations that we're working with these things at are way higher than what you would ever see in a normal simple chemical process. So we're working at 6 to 12 molar or 4 to 8 molar when you're used to working with protein solutions at like micromolar, millimolar, in the worst case tenth molar, that sort of thing. So we're using concentrations that just beat the living crap out of proteins. Um, in a second I'm gonna show you their structures which I do want you to know because it does help to give us some ways of thinking about how chemical denaturants um, might work. Now when we use these methods a lot of times these methods get used I wouldn't say interchangeably but pretty close because a lot of studies have been shown that for um, good protein melting or chemical denaturation experiments you can actually get delta G values for folding unfolding that are comparable for uh, both both methods. Now next I just want to spend a, a, a minute or so talking about how the chemical denaturation methods work which is a very very common method you see in the literature. So when you chemically denature something I said you were using urea and guanidinium chloride at very very high concentrations. The way people think or one of the ways in which people think chemical denaturants work is that whereas heat is literally causing the molecules to become wiggled apart when you use molecules like urea and you're using them at ridiculous concentrations the general idea is that there's there's going to be a disruption of the intermolecular forces in the folded form of the protein so maybe the urea molecules or the guanidinium chloride molecules through the fact that they have all these heteroatoms and can hydrogen bond maybe they create new intermolecular forces with the uh, folded form of the protein along the backbone structure that overcome the normal folding interactions that take place and so you literally swamp out your molecules no more folding pattern by having new intermolecular attractions forming to uh, these these other groups um, so urea is a structure you should know and then guanidinium chloride is a structure you should know remember guanidinium is the same group that's part of the amino acid arginine. So the guanidinyl group is a positively charged um, side chain. Now the one other structure I just want to toss out here, again, um, don't necessarily need you to memorize it per se, 
but it is this one is good to know. Um, it's called beta mercaptoethanol. Beta mercaptoethanol, named for the fact that it, it's a substituted ethanol at the beta carbon. So you've added a thiol group, which is sometimes called a mercaptan. So there's where beta mercaptoethanol comes. Now the reason this one's important is because beta mercaptoethanol, like another molecule we learned about a couple of webcasts ago called DTT, is uh, really good for um, reducing uh, disulfide disulfide bonds. So it converts disulfides to the free thiols. So that's kind of like some quick background. But what we really want to do is to talk about uh, two main issues. In this webcast, we're going to focus on a really, really, really neat experiment done by a person by the name of Anfinson a number of years ago now that really showed um, the relationship between um, protein folding, protein conformation function, and amino acid sequence. So this is a really really important um, study that was done using some of the methods we just got done talking about as well as some other things that I'll mention here. So what Anfinson did is he worked with a protein and the identity of the protein doesn't really matter so much other than it was called ribonuclease A so you'll probably run across this in your reading but it's called ribonuclease and what he did is he did a chemical denaturation experiment where he beat the crap out of your uh, ribonuclease with urea so at a very high concentration of urea to unfold it and then he tossed in some beta mercaptoethanol which had the um, ability to reduce the disulfide bonds so this is just sort of a cartoon that shows the experiment um, on the left side we have a cartoon that's the ribonuclease in its native or its folded form and the idea is like I said he adds all of these denaturing molecules that either uh, break the disulfide bond or unfold the protein. And so the completely unstructured form of the protein is shown in cartoon representation over here. Clearly the disulfide bonds have been lost and it's no longer folded. Now the way Anfinson looked at this of course would be with some of those techniques we talked about a couple of webcasts ago. So for example he might have used um, circular dichroism spectroscopy where you can watch the um, amount of secondary structure decrease as you add chemical denaturing. But here's the key point on this first uh, portion of the Anfinson experiment. When he added things that blew up, not blew up, but unfolded the enzyme, he saw that it was dead. The enzyme no longer had the ability to function and do the job, the enzymatic reaction that ribonuclease does. Wow, isn't that cool? You added a chemical to something and you caused it to stop doing its job. So isn't that an awesome result? No, not really. Because there's a lot of ways to destroy things. It's what he did next that was holy cow. So the next half of the Anfinson experiment, the goal is to undo the first half. After completely tearing a protein apart, unfolding it and breaking disulfide bonds, could you bring it back? And the answer was, holy cow, you could. And so what Anfinson showed with this experiment is that if he removed the denaturant and he removed the beta mercaptoethanol, the BME, in the absence of oxygen, again, the way he removed it would be through something like dialysis, that is allowing small molecules like urea and BME to leave solution, leaving the protein behind. But if he did a removal of urea and BME, without oxygen around, what did he see over time? He saw that the freaking enzyme became active again by itself without doing any tricks. He took a protein that was dead, that was unfolded, that had no structure, and over time, several hours, it was able to refold by itself into the native structure, which again, he could observe through CD, and it had activity. That's pretty cool. But like all good cool research, he didn't want to sit on that. So he did what I like to call the one too many experiment. The one too many experiment is the experiment that you do when you get a cool result and you're like, let's see if we can test this under lots of different kinds of conditions to see how far we can push it. And sometimes you get an experiment when you do that and you end up scratching your head. So what Anfinson did is 
He tried to do the um, restoration of structure and function both without oxygen, like he did in the holy cow experiment, and then did it where he allowed things to reoxidize first when urea is, was around, and then allowed things to uh, then allowed urea to be removed via dialysis. And when he did that, what did he get? It was dead as a doornail. Was not active. Did not refold correctly. Didn't do squat. So something happened depending on the order of how the experiment was conducted that completely changed results in a test tube and so the question is what the heck is going on and this leads to the last part of his experiment that really um, shows just how cool this stuff is so what Anfinson theorized is that when he allowed the protein to oxidize first and then remove the denaturant what he suspected might be happening was that he was getting disulfide bonds forming but they weren't always happening in the right places it was a scrambled mess that is to say oxygen is good at oxidizing thiols to disulfide so if you have oxygen zipping around and the protein has lots of urea present you're gonna get disulfide bonds that form and sometimes they might be right but sometimes they might be in the wrong spots and if they're in the wrong spots the protein can't have the right shape and hence can't have the right function. So what he did was to say, well, why don't we chuck in just a little bit of beta mercaptoethanol into the experiment after the urea was gone to see if things could sort of get fixed with time. That is, if you kick in a little BME, that's going to temporarily un or re-break those disulfide bonds. And then since your chemical denaturant isn't gone, Maybe things can fold up correctly such that you can end up with slowly getting the right disulfide bonds because you have your structural elements maybe more correctly in the right place if there isn't any urea around. And what he found was that um, ultimately if you added a little bit of BME, you end up restoring structure and function over time. So he found a way to show that it was disulfide bonds that were incorrectly forming that were causing the protein to be um, non-functional and not have the correct structure. But if you just squirt it in just a little bit and then allowed the protein to sort of, I don't know how to say this, find themselves with time, that is, they, they through their experiences in life, figured out that they didn't want to do this kind of job. They really wanted to do this job like if we're likening this to the college experience, the molecules could sort of slowly figure out what the right conformation is and eventually through thermodynamic processes were able to adopt the right functional uh, conformation of the protein. And again, to sort of summarize what we're getting out of this experiment is twofold. First, the mere fact that you can take a protein that's a hundred plus amino acids long and just sort of under the right conditions, let it figure itself out, pretty freaking amazing. So that tells you that the primary sequence had the information there. And then second, sometimes when you do things in test tubes, the way the details are really important and they might not be just like they are in cells, so you have to be careful that you make sure you interpret what's happening correctly and you have to do things under the right set of exper or conditions potentially to get the right results. And you shouldn't give up just when you get a temporary setback.